May I invite you all to please take a seat. We are about to start this event, the side event on regional integration from policy recommendation to implementation. I invite you all to please take a seat. So, first of all, thank you all very much for coming in, uh, in a, let's say, in a context of insecurity, you know, with a new variant and the new uh, confinements and, and shutdowns. So thank you very much for making it to the event. We're very glad to have you with us today. In the name of the UFM Secretariat, I would like to welcome you all. And without further ado, please allow me to give the floor to uh, Dr. Abdel Qadir Al Khisasi, the Deputy Secretary General of the Union for the Mediterranean for Economic Development and Employment. He will deliver the welcoming remarks. Dr. Khisasi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, and welcome to our UFM event on regional integration from policy recommendation to implementation, which we organize within the framework of the sixth UFM regional forum. Thank you all for being, being with us today, and thanks to the, the stakeholders joining us online and draw streaming. I'm Abdel Qadil Khisasi, Deputy Secretary General uh, of the Union for the Mediterranean for Economic Development and Employment. And in the name of the UFM family, welcome again and happy Mediterranean Day. A little world, word on uh, logistics, your budget and grants only this, uh, give access only to this event. And we, t we take the chance to invite you all to a networking lunch which, we will, take, uh, which will take place in Studio 8 at uh, exactly at 9 p to 12 p.m. I also remind you that uh, we have translation available in Arabic French and English. Now back to our events. As you may already know, promoting regional cooperation and integration is at the very heart of our mission at the UFM Secretariat. Being fundamentals for more resilient re region that will be capable of addressing the broad variety of challenges that we face in coordinated manner, given the scale and scope of these challenges. Acting up in the task mandated it to by the UFM member states, back in 2017, the UFM Secretariat issued the first edition of the UFM Progress Re uh, Report on regional integration this year with the, the collaboration of OECD and launched it in an online ceremony on 27 May 2021. As I said, the report was conducted by OECD with the financial support of GIZ, BMZ, and it examined five domains of economic regional integration, namely trade, finance, infrastructure, movement of people, and higher education and research. Several policy recommendations come out from the, this report, and today we start discussions, pathways of implementation for some of these recommendations with the participation of a host of prominent speakers from the region. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to invite Mr. Andreas Skal, Director of Global Relations, Secretariat at the OECD, who will be moderating panel one and who will introduce the speakers in his panel. Mr. Mr. Skal, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. El Kisasi, for inviting us, for inviting the OECD. Warm welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, my name is Andrea Schall. I'm Director for Global Relations at the OECD. Uh, and uh, we are very pleased uh, to have close collaboration uh, with the Union for the Mediterranean. And uh, we just launched uh, this year this report on regional integration uh, in the Union for the Mediterranean, uh, in the whole region. Uh, and it's something uh, where we kind of found out that this panel today uh, could not be more timely because there is a lot of potential uh, to do in terms of uh, how to improve the connectivity in the region. And I want to make uh, show three avenues here before introducing 
uh, the, the fellow panelists. Uh, the first avenue uh, to improve uh, connectivity is transport connectivity, and it could not be more timely to be here in Barcelona, uh, where Christoph Columbus started the first example of transport uh, connectivity. Uh, and this is something where we believe in this, uh, this report shows this, that in transport connectivity, there's a lot to do. Uh, there is a fragmented situation uh, uh, of the ports in the region, region very little cooperation, uh, high costs, uh, high, high transaction bureaucratic costs, uh, high uh, across the border costs. And this leads me to my second point, and this is trade connectivity. And in trade connectivity, uh, we, we also face, and uh, we have done at the OECD, a lot of work on trade facilitation indicators, what can be done across the borders to facilitate uh, trade, because we see this region as one of the least integrated regions in the world. We did some studies which show that, uh, for example, in Southeast Asia, you have, well, if you look at the connections between cities, between ports, it goes dish, 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 dish. If you look here in the Mediterranean, the, the connected dots are much more limited. So trade connectivity uh, across the border measures uh, uh, are something which we think uh, is a low-hanging fruit uh, for the region. Uh, and this brings me to, to, to the third element, and I'm glad uh, that we have uh, the, the panelists here, is people-to-people -people connectivity. And uh, I think uh, now I see my, our fellow panelists uh, entering the room. Very warm welcome uh, to Her Excellency, uh, the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, uh, Her Excellency Angeles Moreno Bau. Uh, please, uh, more, my, Your Excellency, please. Uh, can I ask you to come on stage? Uh, because I'm just introducing the panel. So, first, Your Excellency Angeles Moreno Bau, State Secretary for Foreign Affairs and Global Affairs of Spain. Very warm welcome. It's so good to have you with us. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this brings me to, to the second panelist, uh, which I would like to introduce is uh, Dr. Khalida Bussar, who came from New York uh, here to Barcelona, arrived yesterday evening, Assistant Secretary General, Director for the Regional Bureau for Arab States of the UNDP. And then I would like to welcome uh, our third panelist. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, here he is, uh, because we have not uh, been able to see each other. Uh, Mr. Dimitris Dimitriadis, uh, who is president of the external section of uh, the European Economic and Social Committee, the EEC. So very well welcome uh, also to you, Dimitris. Um, and without further ado, let me help you. So, without further ado, I'm also taking my seat, and uh, I leave uh, the lectern for, for you, Your Excellency. We were just introducing the discussion on the basis of a report we did, Madam State Secretary, Regional Integration in the Mediterranean, and I was just introducing the three concepts of transport connectivity, trade connectivity, people-to-people -people connectivity, and now I know that you very much care about uh, these issues. So, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Let me install myself here, masks, microphones, etc. Uh, it's a pleasure meeting you this morning here in this uh, very active uh, forum uh, plus uh, side event. Um, uh, dear uh, colleagues here, uh, Deputy Secretary General, uh, Assistant uh, Secretary General of the UNDP, Director of uh, Global uh, Relations of the OECD, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's a pleasure being uh, in uh, this beautiful Mediterranean city uh, on this beautiful day. Uh, it uh, gives us uh, a lot of hope to be able to uh, build uh, a more prosperous uh, and uh, stable uh, Mediterranean, um, and uh, and uh, to this purpose, we have uh, uh, organized these uh, two gatherings, uh, parallel gatherings here today, to be able to exchange views on how to uh, boost uh, a stronger Euro-Mediterranean area, of course, uh, Omicron permitting uh, this time. 
uh, Spain is honored and uh, proud to be uh, hosting uh, the Union for the Mediterranean uh, and these six uh, foreign ministers regional forum. Uh, the foreign ministers are debating upstairs, sharing their views and ideas uh, on our common challenges uh, and uh, recent events in the region. Their discussion is mainly focusing on the progress made in the five priorities uh, decided on the occasion of the fifth uh, regional forum in uh, 2020 that uh, address our shared goals of peace, stability, development, and prosperity. Those five goals are environmental and climate action, social inclusiveness and equality, digital transformation, sustainable and inclusive economic and human development, and civil protection. Connecting people, this is our ultimate goal, and uh, civil society uh, is uh, key to this purpose. Achieving all those priorities will help us strengthen the connectivity and the connection between the two sides of the Mediterranean because we cannot forget that we rely on each other for our well-being. Today, we have a good opportunity to underline the urgent need for a reinforced cooperation in the Mediterranean region. Uh, which is an area that is important not only to Spain and the Mediterranean countries, but also to the rest of the European Union countries. And this is visible upstairs, where ministers from the 27 countries of the European Union are meeting. Much before launching the Barcelona process in 1995, this region was already a priority for the Spanish foreign policy, and we were indeed pioneers in underlying the importance of creating bonds. During the last few months, or now, uh, or almost a year and a half, the effects of the COVID pandemic has led us to consider new ways of collaboration uh, so that we can develop this partnership. The health, social, and economic emergency comes in addition to other combined challenges arising from conflicts, migratory pressure, climate displacement, climate change, terrorist threats, and uh, therefore the populism arising from all those threats. However, although we have not totally fulfilled the Barcelona Declaration 26 years later, the Barcelona process, the Union for the Mediterranean, is still the only roadmap that we have to achieve progress and prosperity together. As Europeans, we cannot ignore what is happening around us, especially in our neighboring regions. This is why the European Council conclusions on April 19th on a renewed partnership with the southern neighbors took also into account the same goals which require an enhanced and intensified political dialogue throughout the Mediterranean, recognizing the role of the Union for the Mediterranean as an essential platform for regional cooperation. A true association has to consider, though, economic and trade relations. The long-term objective of the trade partnership between the European Union and its southern neighborhood is to promote economic integration in the Euro-Mediterranean area, removing barriers to trade and investment between both the European Union and the southern neighborhood countries and among themselves. Advantages of economic regional integration are well known. Expansion of trade, political cooperation between the parties, and job creation. With this in mind, we have put in place a network of Euro-Mediterranean Association agreements that established free trade areas mainly in goods between the European Union and most of the southern neighbors, with the exception of Syria and Libya. Furthermore, the European Union has launched negotiations to create deep and comprehensive free trade areas with Morocco and Tunisia. We should bear in mind that the two main parameters for bolstering economic integration are trade and foreign direct investment. So far, 
results are far from encouraging. In 2020, the region represented only 4.6% of total European external trade. Total trade in goods between the European Union and the southern neighborhood amounted to 149 million billion euros. The Mediterranean region ranks low as a destination for European foreign direct, direct investment. Despite its geographical proximity and long historical links with several European member states, a scant 2.4% of European foreign direct investment in 2017 was in the, in the Mediterranean. Strengthening trade, investment, and training links with our southern partners remains crucial for the European Union, as evidenced by the document Renewed Partnership with the Southern Neighborhood, a new agenda for the Mediterranean, published by the Commission on February 9, 2021. This plan adds to the traditional areas of cooperation with governance, security, and migration, two new cha chapters, two new challenges, in fact, digital sector and green transitions. The document also states that the European Union shall support the reduction of non-tariff barriers, which represent a major obstacle to trade integration in the region. On the other side, South Mediterranean countries can also do more and better because South-South relations remain weak or even strained. Economic and institutional reforms are progressing only slowly and market transparency is far from European Union standards. We need cooperation from our partners in order to offer companies an adequate business climate where standards and conditions are effectively respected once agreed, access to markets on non-discriminatory terms is guaranteed, and any disputes can be addressed in good faith and according to law. I'm sure that once those conditions are met, our companies will invest and share knowledge and technology with their southern counterparts. We all are interested in developing capacities everywhere in the region and benefiting from related synergies. Finally, we cannot forget other tools to interact, such as the Union for the Mediterranean at the intergovernmental level and other forms such as cities and regions, as well as civil society, where the renewed Annaline Foundation has an important role to play. These ideas appear in the report that we are discussing, debating today. I commend the OECD, the UFM Secretariat, and the German Cooperation Agency for it. The study examines five domains of regional integration, namely trade, financial, infrastructure, movement of people, as well as research and higher education. As I have pointed out, there, are some, there has been some progress on economic integration in the region since the Barcelona process, but the scale and scope of the progress falls short of the region's capacities and resources. The Mediterranean region is still characterized today by an asymmetry of economic realities. The economic convergence between the north and the southern shores promoted by the Barcelona partnership through the development of trade and the establishment of a free trade zone is far from being achieved. Differences in living standards have widened. And employment and migration flows have increased. There are also additional challenges that are affecting integration, such as climate change, the technological revolution and gap, therefore, demographic changes, and pandemic disruption, among others. The report makes interesting recommendations. I will highlight some. It uh, recommends us that agreements on trade in services, that, that we further agreements on trade in services involving southern Mediterranean countries to support the integration of very important sectors of the Union for the Mediterranean Economies into regional value chains. It encourages policies that support industrial diversification, including skills development, 
digitalization and stronger integration in regional and global value chains. All these aimed at promoting local jobs and sustainable economic models. It also encourages political and administrative cooperation on trade to reduce trade costs and administrative burdens, enhancing transparency and digitalizing procedures. It encourages financial reforms to strengthen markets and institutions and modernize legislative frameworks in line with international best practices. It also suggests we should be uh, procuring a better investment climate uh, that can be improved by tackling existing regulatory restrictions to foreign direct investments, especially in the southern, of and, southern and eastern Mediterranean in key sectors for regional integration such as transport and energy connectivity. Governments should promote reforms in the energy sector to encourage investment and the development of renewable energies. The region, it says further, does also need an institutional support in mobility schemes accompanied by skills development, including through greater harmonization of national qualifications, qualifications frameworks in the region. It also suggests uh, that support also applies to investment in research infrastructure, embedding technology in local economies, and that research and development and related high value uh, added activities have to be boosted by supporting infrastructures such as research labs. Governments can foster virtual mobility and brain circulation as an alternative to, to brain drain. In addition, there is a need to facilitate the spread of digital technologies for science and education, such as an open science platforms. These would enable countries to take advantage of new opportunities to regional cooperation, especially in the current context of the pandemic. None of the above is exhaustive. On the contrary, some elements may be more of a priority and many may be complementary. I congrat congratulate the OECD for this excellent report and the UFM for the initiative. We hope that this effort will be followed by consequent progress reports and more important, by specific initiatives and actions. What we can expect from our region and why is cooperation among us still so necessary is clear on this report and in what we see every day in the Mediterranean. Uh, the answers are in our hands, especially in the hands of the people of the Mediterranean area. And the responsibility lies, of course, especially in decision makers, but we have a lot to do as citizens. So let's go to work. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Madam State Secretary. Uh, De Angeles, uh, it was a really inspiring speech. Um, you put uh, the, the highlights on where we, we also see the highlights in the OECD, uh, trade connectivity uh, as an important element. Thanks so much for the nice words about our report. Rest assured, uh, here the team uh, from, the, uh, from the OECD, Maria Rosa and uh, colleagues from the UFM uh, and from the GRZ, we are working hard. We are already discussing the implementation, what can be followed up. and. Uh, one of the things is also that we discussed today in our panel a bit, what could be a follow-up recommendation. You also mentioned uh, the digital tools as a platform um, and uh, the, the question about people-to-people -people connectivity. So my follow-up question to you might be, before I give the floor to the UNDP, uh, what, are there any specific initiatives Spain is currently undertaking to support uh, the, the, the digital connectivity or the people to people connectivity in the region? Well, um, thank you for uh, uh, inviting me uh, to further <laughs> <laughs> the dialogue with you. Um, the um, Spanish cooperation and uh, the Spanish uh, uh, government has been uh, for years uh, investing in uh, the Mediterranean region. This is one of the priorities of our, of our uh, cooperation to development. And um, uh, in the, in the 
um, in the mood that the pandemic has put us, we are investing more uh, also inside uh, our country on digital uh, projects and on digital education. The digital is a new alphabet uh, of the 21st century. It was uh, evident and visible during the pandemic. Uh, it has uh, also shown that uh, it is a, an engine to development and uh, we are um, we are transforming our cooperation and our projects uh, into these uh, these new um, these new era um, activities and uh, and areas and uh, one of them is the digital. So we we are transforming our cooperation programs into digital, digital education, digital for the administration because it narrows uh, the relation between the citizens and their administration and the governor and the governors. You see, now we are already in the implementation of uh, what, you, what you asked us to do, do so, so count on, on the OECD to continue supporting Spain and to, to work hand in hand uh, to further promote, uh, because it, I think it, indeed connectivity sometimes sounds as a very technical word, but it's about people. And whatever we can do also to use digital technologies to bring the people closer together, uh, to make uh, the, the education standards more comparable, to create the digital platforms is something which we have in mind in terms of the implementation. But we will uh, go deeper into this. And uh, it's my great pleasure now to ask uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Khalida Bussar, uh, the Assistant uh, Secretary General, Director of the Regional Bureau of the Arab States uh, of the UNDP, to, to present her presentation. We just made in, met in Egypt, uh, where we signed a, a big cooperation program with Egypt, which is another crucial player here in the Mediterranean. So please, uh, I give the floor to you. Feel free to either take it uh, from your seat or if you feel more comfortable to no, I can. Uh, yeah. I, I can stay. Okay. I can, can, can we check whether the mic is working? The mic is working. Yeah. Okay. Yes, so yes. please, uh, Dr. Khalida, uh, thank, the floor thank is thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. It's a pleasure to meet you again, um, and congratulations for the report. It's indeed a thought leadership piece that uh, will be very useful for us in the region. Um, first of all, I mean, uh, this morning I wanted to say that I signed an MOU on behalf of the NDP. Um, to, uh, with the Union for the Mediterranean, to, uh, identifying some uh, key areas of work. So uh, it's, we have achieved the target already. Um, in the, in the, with regards to the, the progress report that uh, you produced, it was presented to my team in New York and in the Arab states, uh, 17 countries. And, um, you said it, the achievements are still below the expectation. Her Excellency mentioned also that uh, we need to remove the barriers. We also need more uh, FDI um, for in direct investment. Uh, in, but there was some progress, if I may say, under your control, Andrea. The building of extensive transport and energy networks and the signatures of uh, agreement on labor and education mobility. We can say that as technology evolves, the, uh, the socio-economic uh, opportunity uh, are transformed, can be increased. But in, most, in the most direct uh, manifestation, digital connectivity can help, can boost uh, the regional uh, integration by reducing the administrative uh, burdens like, like trade, but also facilitating cross-border um, digital payment, and more importantly, maybe bringing transparency. I think it's an important point. Um, it can accelerate innovation. Your Excellency, you mentioned uh, research and development, but also the exchange of knowledge, the new frontier of economic competitiveness across border. Not least, digital transformation is helping to recover from the pandemic. In UNDP, we have initiated 250 new digital projects in more than 100 countries to respond and address uh, and to recover the, the COVID-19. And I would like to say also to add something that is not measurable, but this digital transformation can also help to bring the South and the North closer at the political level. 
I think it's an important point. Digitalization has also be, been a key driver for financial inclusion, sustainability, uh, sustainably promote access, use, and financial literacy. And this is very important because it can help to empower people. We are talking about population that is sometimes marginalized uh, in rural areas, in the developing countries more importantly, where, some, where women don't even have access to a bank account. So for us, if we mo promote uh, digitalization, it will give access to new markets. It will uh, get access to savings and empower the people uh, as savers, lenders, borrowers, investors, and also taxpayers, which is not negligible vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government. We talk about digitalization, but we are not talking about digitalization in a vacuum. It's fundamentally intertwined, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Andrea, before, with the form of infrastructure and connectivity. If you take, for example, just energy, to mention an example, Big data enhanced and with machine learning and artificial intelligence can generate novel, actionable, analytical uh, skills and scale that were not possible before. For example, in, uh, we have a hub uh, on sustainable energy and the aim is to support, I know it sounds very ambitious, but is to support accelerating access to sustainable energy mm -hmm. for 500 million people worldwide, and not only in the region, in the next four years. Of course, together with partners, nobody can do it alone. Mm -hmm. uh, concretely, I mean, it helps also to bring, uh, in this case, it will bring electricity, bringing electricity to remote areas, or even, for example, we are doing it in Lebanon, which, is, uh, which used to be an upper middle income country, but also to ensure independence in accessing uh, energy. But one thing that I wanted to, to mention also is to ensure that we give access to energy that is clean, yes, but is affordable, that people can pay for. And this is a big issue even in countries, rich countries like yeah. Lebanon, as I mentioned. So the potential for digital transformation is certainly clear, but uh, we need to be careful. We need to have careful attention. Emerging digital technologies are inadequately designed. If they are inadequately designed, can further exacerbate the existing inequalities among, you know, uh, in developing countries among and within uh, developing countries. So for us in, in NDP, we have a strategic plan every four years. The one that we are talking about now is 2022-2025. And it has as one of the key uh, strategic uh, direction, structural transformation, uh, particularly for green, inclusive, and digital transition as one of the uh, strategic direction. In supporting the development of digital ecosystems, we are driven by four principles. Universality, first. Second, responsibility across, uh, around the adverse effect of technologies, even distribution of the gain, and uh, again, transparency. So uh, we, have our, we have launched, we were the first agency that has launched its digital uh, strategy in 2019, but now we know we need to upgrade it because mm -hmm. the world has changed around us and we will do so uh, as we speak, we are doing that. Um, we are also, uh, because we are on the ground, I mean, in the Arab states we have seven countries, country offices, but also the region, the Mediterranean region includes all other countries from Europe Bureau. So for example, uh, we are supporting development of national digital policies and uh, strategies around the world. And for example, we, we, with UNDP uh, Estonia, e-governance academy, we have conducted digital landscape assessment in the state of Palestine and Jordan, and we are doing it also in Iraq and Kuwait. So it's a good example what the, uh, the, the region can bring, uh, bringing together countries from the north and the south, and then further detail and transfer the knowledge from the south to the south. I think uh, we call it tri triangular tr uh, cooperation. 
Um, in terms of, also I want to, uh, to mention enhancing access to and delivery of digital services. We mentioned e-government and you, your excellency you mentioned that, but also private sector channels. For example, in Libya we have uh, uh, developed uh, an application with the, EU, uh, with the EU uh, to enable, you know, build ecosystem for entrepreneurs and it has enabled the creation of 85 startup, but also uh, again on the political dimension that sometimes we forget. We have supported the, uh, it's called um, a telemedicine startup with Japan and a private sector company in the Ministry of Health in Libya, where we, we were able to provide you know, uh, medical services through this platform and we brought together effective dialogue between health work workers from the east and the west, the west, and they were not talking to each other before. So through a non-taboo entry point, we were able to bring some dialogue. Um, the other opportunity area, and this is very key, more specifically in the Arab part of this region, is job creation. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think I heard your Excellency uh, were talking about that. We are facing uh, a challenge on this part of the, the, the world, on the south, where a lot of young people want to migrate. We also have displaced people. And uh, for us in UNDP, and for me in particular, job creation is a must. We have the highest uh, unemployment rate worldwide in the Arab region, and most specifically among the youth and those that want to migrate. And the other challenge I wanted to put also on the table is the issue of uh, formal versus informal market. Mm. And uh, you might not know, but 86% of the young people work in the informal market. So it has shown during this pandemic they were further marginalized because they were not formally in the market. And this is where digitalization can help them to integrate the market, can be more attractive to young people. And again, I want to mention all, uh, the rural areas because the, the world has a lot of difficulties to keep the farmers in the rural areas because we talk about the migration from the south to the north, but within the south, we have a huge issue of migration from the from the rural to the urban areas. So uh, I think with that, uh, what I would like to, uh, to stop. Uh, and thank you very much. I, I guess you will have a follow-up question for me. But I look forward to continue working with you, with the Union for the Mediterranean. And thank you for hosting us in this beautiful city of Barcelona. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Kalida, for, for coming over from New York, uh, for, for taking the reverse uh, Christoph Columbus uh, yeah. pass, uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, for, for being with us in this wonderful city of Barcelona yeah. today. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not in a very sunny room, but we, we will have this for, for lunch. Let me say you said uh, speak, you are speaking under my control, but uh, the OECD always speaks under the control of the <laughs> UN. Uh, and uh, thanks for, for, for your, again, uh, insightful uh, remarks. Uh, you mentioned the opportunities of the digitalization for the connectivity, but you also mentioned the challenges linked to the digital divides. Uh, uh, North-South uh, developed uh, versus developing men, women, uh, the question around old uh, youth. Uh, so uh, I want to, to ask you uh, as a follow-up uh, about some concrete ideas, how to avoid uh, this kind of um, divides, how to overcome. Uh, you, you, said, uh, you mentioned a few things uh, in the transition from informality to formality for the young people. Uh, but this is, I think, something which is in all of our minds when we think about making best use of digitalization, and I know that the UN uh, very much cares about. And maybe a, a second element in this game, is there a need for more public-private partnership? Is there a role more for the private sector to overcome precisely these divides? We had just a final remark from my side. We are trying, we have a Women Economic Empowerment Forum for, for the region where we precisely try to work out uh, on potential, where, where is potential for uh, women economic um, entrepreneurship and uh, employment uh, in light of this digital technology. So maybe you can say a few words on, on this. Okay, thank you very much. It's, um, 
Yeah. First of all, you mentioned the, the divide. I just want to zoom on the gender, digital gender divide. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, it's really a major barrier to meaningful participation in a digital society. Mm -hmm. So across the Arab state, for example, half of the women do not have access to internet. So it's huge. Uh, so half of the population uh, in the Arab world is women, and half of the women do not have access. What does it mean? It means 25% of the population do not have access to internet. So with this, I think it's very important that also you, you, you see the divide between rural and, and urban. If you look at the, the access to internet in 2019, only 28.4% of the rural households had access. Well, if you look at the urban households, 74%. So it's almost double. So you see a double divide among men and women um, among rural versus urban. This is one thing. Now, in terms of what's happening, uh, I must say that most of the local and national level uh, government have developed policies. Mm -hmm. But the challenge uh, is to how to translate the policies into, into activities. Um, so one thing, uh, so for us, first of all, we need to promote uh, access to, to, uh, to internet, to digital uh, technology, but also, again, I come back to the comment I made on en access to energy, is the cost, the affordability. I think this is very important for us to ensure that this is affordable. But the second, uh, you asked me for some, uh, some ideas. Um, we talked about uh, the divide between men and women, but there is a category of, of population which is often marginalized. I'm talking about the disabled people. Mm. Uh, we s unfortunately often forget about them. Uh, for example, you mentioned Egypt uh, earlier, and uh, we have developed in partnership with the Ministry of Communication of Egypt, uh, the first artificial intelligence sign language chatbot in Africa and the Middle East. So this dedicated application and website was servicing the, the hearing impaired individual in terms of the COVID-19 information because there was a huge gap there. So this is the type of ideas we would like to promote. Then the second question, you mentioned the role of the private sector and if one, th one thing uh, was shown during this COVID-19, government cannot do everything. We need to talk to involve the private sector. COVID has shown it, but also if we are serious about talking about sustainable development, it can achieve only with, with the private sector. So for that, I think this is very, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, the first assumption. Uh, opportunities for young people again, and uh, as I mentioned, it's the highest unemployment rate in the Arab states. So for us, uh, we need to mobilize a category and coalition of partners. Uh, OECD is one of them as the thought leader, but concretely, uh, we want to, uh, to cooperate more with the SMEs. For example, we have uh, a partnership with GSMA, which is a mobile association where we brought together young entrepreneurs that benefited for, from coaching to enable them to access, uh, to access new jobs, but also to create their, their new, uh, their new, their new, uh, 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 new jobs, but also to create their own, their own uh, uh, companies. I think also just to conclude that uh, with this digitalization, I think it will open doors to more equalities among men and women, but also among the youth, maybe to help to stabilize them in their own countries in order not to migrate, because I know it's a major issue in the northern part of the, this region. Thank you very much. Sorry if I was long. No, thanks so much. Uh, no worries that you were long because I asked so many questions. So yeah. <laughs> I pretended to ask one and I asked three. So uh, sorry for that <laughs> on my side. And uh, I, I I mean, I very much agree with you. Uh, there is a lot to do, to do, and you said uh, nobody can can do it alone. Uh, so let's uh, let's just walk the talk going forward, together with uh, with uh, leading countries like Spain, a leading organization like the UN. And this uh, this brings me also to to our third panelists. Uh, 
who is uh, also very active uh, in this field uh, as uh, the president of the external relations section of the European Economic and Social Committee. So a very warm welcome uh, to Dimitris Dimitriadis. Um, please, without further ado. Can I use the podium? Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Let me just put this here. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency. Uh, really, we are living in a very strange world. Yesterday night, uh, according to my program, tomorrow it was necessary to be in Marrakesh because His Excellency, the Secretary General of UFM, should open the Euromed Summit, a big event with more than 350 participants from all over the Mediterranean. Yesterday night, the whole project prepared for more than six months collapsed because Morocco closed due to the new variation. That means the word connectivity every day for all of us means something more important, more important, more important. And I will not stay only to the digital connectivity, but to the physical connectivity because we are human beings. I decided to come from Brussels here because I need it as a human being to be here in Barcelona and because it's an honor for me to be with you here in this panel. Now, uh, I hear the, the first intervention from Her Excellency, the Secretary of State, and I hear again the world Barcelona process and we are coming back 20, 25 years back. Uh, with your permission, uh, Your Excellency, we have very, very few success stories to tell about Barcelona process. And uh, sorry to tell you, because I'm coming from the private sector and I'm not very diplomat, I don't think that we have succeeded a lot with the, under Barcelona process. A lot of good intentions, a lot of good plans, a lot of good statements, a lot of good press releases. At the end, very few projects. Why? Why we didn't succeed the Barcelona process? We know why, we know well. First of all, it is the European bureaucracy. And unfortunately for the European bureaucracy, a lot of times we cover the European bureaucracy behind a very big capital letters world, transparency. We use the word transparency and to stop to work with Mediterranean. Because it is, ladies and gentlemen, it is impossible for Mediterranean to use all the same rules as we used in the northern part of Europe. It is impossible. I am Greek, as you can understand easily from my name. It is impossible in Mediterranean to have exactly the same criteria as they used the northern part of Europe. It's impossible. And unfortunately, the European bureaucracy cannot understand it. For this reason, the whole META program, one of the most important European program, failed totally the last 25 years. It was impossible the, our counterparts in Mediterranean to use the META program and the money of the META program. It's impossible. Now, we are living in a very, very difficult period. We are talking for digital transformation. We are talking for digital connectivity. We have lack of infrastructures. Uh, in uh, connectivity, we have lack of, of uh, uh, investments in digital transformation. But according to the European programs, there are more than 10 billion euros in Brussels ready to use for digital connectivity. Can we succeed? This is the big question today. And the most important, we don't have, we have lack of skills. In Europe, the, now, today, it's impossible to find well educate young people to work in the digital society. It's impossible. Very few people are available to work in the companies, in the society, in the, the public sector. That means it's a big opportunity for Mediterranean. Why? Because on the other side of Mediterranean, there are a lot, hundreds of well educated young persons that they can trans they can move their lives their families in, in Europe. And it, this will be a win-win case. Because otherwise, it is impossible for Europe to cover this big gap for the, di for the digital transformation. As European Economic and Social Committee, we represent the civil society organization and the social partners. And we are working very close with the Union for Mediterranean. For this year, our next summit, I don't know when and how, because as I told you, according to our program, it was to start the 
2021 summit in Marrakesh and the next one, most probably in Cairo, but we don't know yet what will be happen, will be about digital transformation in Mediterranean. Okay. And of course, the second important topic, energy. But it is not only that. It is not only digital transformation. We must see why we lost all these opportunities these 30 years and to solve the problems now to to have better connection between brussels and the brussels institution with mediterranean it's very important for all of us thank you very much thank you so much uh, dimitris uh, for for your very open and frank remarks uh, so uh, it's, uh, there is indeed no need to have to com for complacency, so we need to uh, always take a hard look. But it's a question whether this glass is half full or whether it's half empty when looking at the Barcelona process. I think, uh, I mean, I was a German government official who actually attended Barcelona in, when was it, 1995? 1995. 1995. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking back. I think we have achieved uh, quite, quite a bit, but uh, still, there, there is, uh, there is a, a way to go in the sense, in the spirit of this class. So in this context, I wanted to, to give you a follow-up question because it's very important to, as you said, to, to have the private sector perspective. And very often the private sector is uh, saying, this goes too slow, this, goes, uh, uh, this should be, be more advanced, this should be more ambitious. But let me play the ball back. Uh, what can the private sector do? This is the question of one million euros. <laughs> uh, it's very easy. Uh, I had exactly the same, I have answered to this question more than 100 times because I'm coming from the private sector. It's very easy for the, put the money on the table and the private sector will come. It's easy, but it is impossible to break all these constraints and burdens to come to a project. For this reason, a lot of times, European Union failed to implement this kind of projects because the private sector doesn't participate. It's not easy for the companies a lot of times due to the bureaucracy. This is the problem. And of course, a lot of time with the banking problems, but let's not open this kind of discussion about the banking sector because we need another two days. Okay, but okay, point, point taken. But uh, with that uh, answer, you have probably ticked uh, 500,000 of the uh, 1 million. <laughs> uh, so let, let, me ball play, let me play the ball back again. I mean, but, I mean sometimes, you know, I mean, in the, in the international scene, we often face uh, the situation that we have the money, but we are not having the idea or the project. So what kind of ideas or project would you advance from, from the private sector side in order to, to tackle this issue? Thank you. I, I will give you a very s s so, uh, small uh, example. My brother-in-law is professor in Tufts University in Boston. I, he is Greek. He is Greek-American. And I asked him more than a hundred times, for what reason? He, he's granted more than five million uh, US dollars every two, three years. Why you didn't apply in the European Union? You make research. It is in a very important university. Why don't you ask for European money? And he told me, what? to make 100 applications for 1 million euros. I make one seat page to the Federal Reserves and I received 5 million in two, 20 minutes. For what reason to, to have this kind of problems with the European bureaucracy? This is the answer. Okay, thanks so much. We, we may be now at uh, 750,000, but still not <laughs> at a million. Uh, so let me ask the fellow panelists, Angeles or uh, Dr. Kalida, you want to, to go into this debate, what the private sector can do? Feel free. Uh, we've been working a lot on these uh, ideas, sorry, of the um, uh, alliances of public and private sector. I definitely think this is the only way uh, forward. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there is bureaucracy, but this is the only way to grant the citizens that every penny put in uh, taxes uh, and in uh, uh, public spending is under control. So. Uh, we need to boost this private, uh, public-private uh, cooperation and uh, definitely uh, I think that the digital uh, sector is a key, uh, is a key sector for the private sector uh, and also for the public. So there is a, there is a, 
a pilot uh, project that we can boost in the Mediterranean for sure with the, with, with the help of, uh, of also international organizations, of course, yes. and their, um, their financing of these projects. Maybe Lina. if I can bring a um, perspective uh, from a developing country context. I think one of the challenge uh, for us is not really, it's not only bu bureaucracy, but it's also access to financing. Uh, for a poor person in a developing country, you need to have uh, guarantees and you don't have collateral. If you don't have yeah. collateral, you cannot borrow. So for us, uh, what is important is also to establish guarantee funds for these poor people to be able to, uh, to borrow to establish their own company. Now also at the government level in developing countries, talking about my own country, Algeria, if I can make that, that comment, there is a lot of incentive for young people to create their own enterprises. So this is where we see the complement between public and private and the government has also a role to encourage uh, young people, I'm talking about the youth mainly, to, to invest, to accompany them in financial literacy, in developing their business plan, but also to have access to uh, good, uh, good loans. In the case of Algeria, I think they were giving loans at zero percent. So uh, it's a package, it's not only one size. No, we could not agree more about uh, the package and about uh, the, the joint efforts and uh, also, as, as you said, to, to really uh, work together in joint projects is a, is a way to go. So I guess this brings us closer to the million now. Uh, <laughs> and with that in mind, I, I would like to open the floor. Uh, don't be shy. This is a rather, I mean, besides the millions following us on, on YouTube and uh, in the net, uh, this is a rather uh, intimate uh, uh, setting. So feel free to ask any questions. I see one question. Uh, down here. Maybe you introduce yourself uh, very, very quickly. Have, can we have, have a microphone there? And Hello. indicate to whom you want to ask the question or whether you yes. want all panelists uh, to, to answer. Okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you for this uh, interesting panel. It's a question, I think, basically for Mr. <coughs> Dimitriadis, but uh, also other panelists can maybe comment. I know Mr. Dimitriadis is linked to a leading Greek organization, employers organization. Do you think there is a role for these employers or business support organizations to, cl to sort of uh, close this divide between public and private sector? Can, we, can these organizations in the north and the south of the Mediterranean help uh, solve all these problems that you mentioned, like access to finance, uh, subsidies, uh, et cetera? If you can comment on this. Thank you for the question. Yes, they play these roles. Uh, according to what I know, because I represent employers' organization in Brussels 25 years, they play these roles as consultants, basically, because uh, uh, the big problem for basically the small medium enterprises, it is to receive the proper information to participate to this kind of projects and projects and programs. And the employers' organization play this role. It's important because for a small medium enterprise it's impossible to participate to this kind of project without knowledge and the knowledge is very expensive now the employers organization they play this consultant role i don't see any further reaction on on, on this question so uh, is there are there any further questions please uh, here Good morning, my name is Youssef Arouj. I'm from uh, Egypt, uh, representing Mediterranean News Foundation. Briefly, it's an Egyptian movement uh, oriented and inspired by the Mediterranean. Um, I was so happy to hear uh, from Ms. Uh, Khalida that they have uh, programs designed for the Medit South Mediterranean region. But let me share with you that opportunities as a young person coming from this sensitive area still very, very limited. For example, my organization working with Erasmus, with Youth Exchange of Programs, blah, blah, blah. And once we uh, announced for an opportunity uh, to attend the Baltic Arabic Seminar in Estonia, we wanted to hire two participants to, to travel. We received 846 applications. Considering that we are a small organization, we don't have a lot that big number of followers. How we can select two 
from 846 applications, I'm talking about normal use exchange program. So opportunities is still very, very limited. And here I would like to invite all partners, all international organizations to invest more, to create more opportunities for the South Mediterranean region. The second point for Her Excellency, uh, actually one of the main approaches to achieve the regional integration is free mobility. To be more specified, youth mobility. Uh, when we um, plan and design and implement for uh, European grants under Erasmus or European Solidarity course, whatever, when we apply for the Schengen visa, it's very hard to receive it. It takes time. Sometimes we miss the project. And we many times I ask to issue a special visa for volunteering or for youth or for civil society organizations. Because after we spend six or eight months planning, designing, finding partners, waiting for the results. After that, the embassy or the policy of that country destroy all our efforts, destroy our, all our hopes because the visa. So please find the solution to facilitate our mobility. I know it's your rights to save your safety in your countries, but also it's our rights as young people to, to, to feel our freedom when we go from uh, this country to that country. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, Thank you. Important, uh, important voice and statement from the next, uh, the younger generation. Uh, Kalida, first to you yeah. and then yeah. to Angeles. And then let me already announce, I will do then a final round uh, where I ask all the three panelists to give me in one minute three priorities, uh, which we need to advance forward. So you can already reflect on that. Uh, because this is not prepared, <laughs> so <laughs> spontaneous. So, Kalida, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, I, I don't think uh, his comment uh, calls for uh, an answer, but I invite you to talk to me afterwards. We have a UNV program, United Nations Volunteers program, and we give the opportunity for uh, young people to integrate the United Nations, I mean, at a very low level for two years, and then they have an opportunity to build their skills and maybe integrate and go somewhere. So this is one, one option. We have also graduate program. We have different facilities. So if you want, we can talk about it. Thank you, Thank you for your question. Um, I believe that uh, mobility is essential for development. And that uh, mobility uh, to educate uh, uh, the youth is essential too. Uh, the Erasmus program is a key program, uh, uh, scholarships to, uh, to study in uh, European countries uh, provided by uh, national governments is key to what I can tell you uh, in my experience uh, in consular affairs, which I have had uh, a couple of times, indeed in Egypt I was a consul years ago, is that we try to do our best to, uh, to satisfy the needs of, uh, of uh, citizens to travel abroad. And especially if it is for students, we pay attention to those, uh, to those requests. And if uh, it is because they are traveling under an Erasmus uh, scholarship, the, the, the visa will be granted. So it may be uh, delayed for uh, because, because we have all these, uh, in this case, yes, bureaucratic system that needs to check uh, with the, all our member uh, states uh, within the Schengen system, but the visas are granted. Hmm? And uh, I, let, me, let me just uh, um, uh, answer to your, uh, to your request for an answer when you have to deal with 800 uh, uh, applications and you have to choose two. Uh, simply said, the digital will help us with the algorithm <laughs> to have the two <laughs> in board. But we need definitely to encourage having more scholarships. I agree with you. And we are trying to do also an effort in Spain to have more uh, bilateral scholarships, to more national scholarships uh, added to the Erasmus program. Okay, thank you very much. So this brings us, I think, uh, I take one final <laughs> question and then I do the final round. So please. Huh? Sorry? Okay, so because we take two final questions, but we take them uh, because it's, then we have perfect gender equality in the questions also, like we have in the podium, which is great. <laughs> uh, so please. Uh, we take the two questions just in a row and then 
Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, uh, well, my name is Cristina Rovia, coming from Oxfam Intermont. I wanted uh, to put a follow-up question on, on human mobility, as, as it appeared already. Um, as you know, as we discussed, the European Pact of Migration and Asylum, and, and an asylum is being discussed at the moment. Um, and, and this is a political process where I have the feeling that um, um, human mobility across the Mediterranean is going to be further blocked and restricted um, with a huge emphasis on readmissions, reinforcing capacities of border control in third countries, especially in Northern Africa. So my question, um, especially for Angeles Moreno Bao, is, is the Spanish government willing to take a stand and fight for legal safe pathways in this process? And if so, which ones? Um, and, and also even if the Spanish government or you know, um, also the European interlocutor, Dimitris, is going to fight for humanitarian vices because we know human mobility, of course, for some elements has a, for some cases has a strong emphasis on opportunities, as you were mentioning, for young people, but also being in a region with protracted crisis, at least we should be fighting for humanitarian vices or other legal and ambitious safe pathways. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm going to take the second question and then I ask yeah. you to, to answer right away. Please. This is some sports for the ladies with the microphone. Please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Zulka and I come from Albania. I'm a youth representative from Young Professionals Network. And I heard here before from the panelists that the skills, skills enhancement and inclusion of youth uh, were also mentioned. Today it's the 29th of November and it's uh, 28th and 29th are the Independence Days for Albania. But I chose to be here at this room. Why? Because Albania is one of these Western Balkans countries that, let's say, is trying to open the negotiations with EU. Nevertheless, it's still part of EU continent and um, every citizen, I travel a lot in the region, and every citizen from Western Balkans is waiting like uh, eagerly to be part of EU. Uh, thank you, <laughs> previous speaker from, from Egypt for bringing it, uh, okay. like the discussion on youth. So that skips my first question. Uh, my second question would be, what are the thoughts, it's not specifically, uh, but maybe for the whole panel, what are your thoughts um, and uh, the future plans maybe for the inclusion of Western Balkan countries um, in the uh, Mediterranean plan? Thank you. Thanks so much. I mean, as a German wearing Japanese watch, I'm very conscious to end on time. <laughs> but uh, can I ask the organizer, can I take uh, the lady over there one more? Because if we have a good debate, so please. Actually, uh, actually, I don't have a question. I'm just uh, taking a, a what, after what has said Mr. Dimitris, and uh, we are representing BusinessMed, which is the employer's organization in the Euro-Mediterranean uh, area, and we do have more than 20 countries represented in the employers, so we are the private sector. And indeed, as you said, we are suffering from this uh, part of the bureaucracy of the Brussels, we are here, we are always here for all the meetings and uh, I think this kind of meeting, I came from Tunisia, I was supposed to go to Marrakesh uh, tomorrow uh, and we have like not even one minute to speak and to bring our uh, voice uh, within the Mediterranean and within the European side. So the job creation in the South Mediterranean is very, very tough and as you said, it's not the same as European uh, partners. So if you create this Euro-Mediterranean perspective, this Mediterranean vision, you have to hear the voice of private sector and particularly the voice of South Mediterranean countries. But unfortunately, most of the time we see that the organization are managed from the Europe side, even if they work for the Euromed uh, perspective and particularly for the South, so they don't know what we are uh, suffering from the other side and they are talking about the mobility. You don't know that we have to do this visa, we have to apply for all these papers, for the audit, uh, um, this PLF when you go to the country for the, for the European side. So you have to hear the voice of the private sector and that's what I'm taking just one minute to, get to insist on that and I was very glad to hear the intervention of the Mr. Dimitris. Thank you. 
Oh, thanks, so, thanks so much, uh, very pertinent intervention. And this is precisely what this meeting should be about, uh, that we talk uh, between the, the two sides of the river. Uh, and two sides of the river means uh, the northern and the southern side of the Mediterranean, uh, but two sides of the river means also government and businesses, uh, social, so civil society. So I play the ball uh, first. Madam State Secretary. Oh, or? okay. No, no, no it's, it's okay. That's for me? Okay. No, no, it's, I think it's no, let's go. Okay. Thank you for uh, your question. Uh, um, Oxfam is very constructive, usually, uh, with uh, uh, your remarks. Uh, and we take very much into account your reports, too. Uh, when I was a Secretary of State for, for Cooperation, especially, as you know. Um, migration needs to be balanced. We need, we need indeed, uh, uh, incoming uh, uh, um, um, citizens to Europe because we are an old, uh, an old continent with little uh, uh, um, uh, democra demo um, demographic um, uh, uh, increase. So we need to have um, uh, incoming uh, migrants, but we need to have them in a regular manner because when they, um, when they are traveling uh, uh, by sea, uh, pushed by, uh, by traffickers, by smugglers, they lose their lives, and this is not what we want. We need to have a regular, um, uh, f uh, frame framework to um, let them get in. Uh, this is what uh, the uh, migration pact in Europe is about, to try to have a balance of all interests and uh, to be able to provide uh, regular, uh, regular op opportunities and regular migrants opportunities to come to uh, Europe. Uh, we will be working also in the Rabat process uh, that uh, Spain is uh, heading uh, this year. We started our presidency this uh, November. Uh, the Rabat process is also a process where we have been working on migration uh, with taking into account uh, the voices of the origin, the transit, and the uh, destination countries, and uh, we will be working also with uh, this idea that we need to provide more visas for regular migration um, to uh, southern countries. So um, uh, the same goes for uh, Western Balkan countries. Uh, we uh, are concentrated here on uh, the southern neighborhood, uh, but here we have countries from all Europe, uh, and once. Uh, Western Balkan countries will uh, join the European Union. Uh, those who are not already, which are not already uh, in the European Union will be also joining those efforts. And concerning the last question, of course we are very interested in hearing the voices of the South. And uh, I'm glad you uh, pointed out, uh, uh, you pointed at this point, uh, because uh, we need to find more fora, this is one, but uh, but we need maybe to, um, to um, be more active and create more uh, uh, synergies between uh, uh, the civil societies of uh, both shores, hmm? not only the, as, as mm. we are discussing here in an intergovernmental fora uh, or business uh, links, but we need to have civil societies communicate more. So hopefully you will be uh, <laughs> pushing for that. Thank you. A no, very good point, and uh, count on us uh, to be on board and support. Kalida? I don't think the question were addressed to me, but uh, maybe to react to the last point on uh, listening to the private sector from the south. I think it's very important, and don't believe that, um, I don't know how to say it, uh, remaining politically correct. Uh, don't believe, that, don't think that the, the north ha has all the knowledge. The south also can enrich the north. So. In that, uh, I would like to refer to also what you said earlier, that uh, the future is in the hands of the citizens. So I encourage you to push very more, and I would like to meet you after this panel, because for us, private sector is also a critical actor if we want to us achieve the SDGs, and we are far from doing that in, this, in the southern part of the Mediterranean. 
Thank you. Uh, first of all, I will follow your approach. I will see the glass half full. And transparent. And transparent, <laughs> yes, okay. Uh, I think that uh, we have a, a very important element that we don't have time to discuss, and it is the time. Because the world is changing every day. Mm -hmm. That means the future belongs to both sides of Mediterranean, and we must work together, but we must run because the whole world is changing every day. And if we will not succeed the digital connectivity as soon as possible, we will lose the train together. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Dimitri. So now, very quickly, each of you one minute, starting with Dimitri. What? Ah, I thought that this was my one minute. OK, I will no. give you one. And three priorities, three or pri give me two, whatever. OK, uh, three but priorities. If we meet one year from now, what, uh, what do we need to have accomplished? It is ah. in, in one year. Oh. It's a very little that time for, for Mediterranean, but in any case, <laughs> take two. <laughs> uh, the problem is, uh, yes, uh, it is necessary, first of all, to uh, re rethink about our trade agreements. We have trade on the table, but we don't have digital services between the agreements in, in Mediterranean. It's very important. Second, we must run immediately the European programs, and the European programs are on track. And third important element, it is the our counterparts in Mediterranean to understand that it, there is no time for more sophisticated debate. It is necessary for implementation. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent yes, pitch. Well, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I, I would say in terms of priorities, reduce the inequalities, for sure. Reduce the, uh, the divide, if not eliminate the divide, and give uh, more economic opportunities equally to men and women, especially for youth. Okay. Excellent. Well, good, uh, good, important pitch and uh, full support from our side. Uh, more investment, private and public, and more education. Yeah. Okay, this, uh, this brings us uh, to a close. Uh, also excellent uh, points, uh, I mean, reflecting on what we have been discussing <laughs> about uh, the class uh, uh, making the glass full, uh, and there is enough water here on the table for all of us fill uh, to, to fill it. Uh, count on the OECD, count on us uh, to help and support your endeavors. Uh, there will be an OECD <coughs> MENA uh, business advisory in, in February 2022, to which I invite all of you. And uh, uh -huh. we, will, uh, we will certainly uh, follow up on what we've been writing in our reports, because we're not uh, writing reports uh, just for the sake of writing reports. I want to thank all the panelists here for a very thank stimulating very discussion. And I have to say, uh, as I said, being chairman we wearing a Japanese watch, we, we exceeded for, for yeah. 10 minutes. Uh, so my apologies. Uh, <laughs> usually, I try to end uh, these things on time. But it was worse, because there was good substance. And uh, uh, you probably saw all <coughs> people in the room that the <coughs> panel here is very engaged in make this change happen and uh, fill the glass. Thank you very much indeed, and look forward uh, to the next uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh no. <laughs>
All right. Good morning again. I invite you all to please take a seat. First of all, thank you very much, Mr. Shal and the panelists of the first panel. And it's now time for the second panel. So this is Mohamed El Razez, the Regional Integration Coordinator of the Union for the Mediterranean. And I'm very pleased to be moderating this panel, this time dedicated to accelerating growth through regional economic integration. The focus of this panel will be given to trade integration, investment promotion, as well as financial markets integration. And for that purpose, I have yet another distinguished host of panelists whom I would like to invite to join me here at this stage. So for that purpose, His Excellency Ambassador Lazar Komanescu, the Secretary General of the Permanent International Secretariat of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation. Excellency, please join us on the stage and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Please have a seat. I would also like to invite His Excellency Ambassador Saeed Moussi, the Ambassador of Algeria in Madrid. Excellency, thank you for joining us today. Please take a seat. And last but never least, I would like to welcome both professionally and personally someone who is no stranger to the Union for the Mediterranean, Ms. Anna Terron, the director of the Federación, eh, la Fundación eh, Internacional y para Iberoamérica de Administración y Políticas Públicas. Mr. Terron, please join us on the stage. I would also like to let you know that we have two more distinguished speakers who have kindly sent us video messages that we will project in due time. The first is Ms. Isabelle Durand, the uh, uh, Assistant uh, or Deputy Secretary General of the UNCTAD, the United Nations uh, Con Conference on Trade and Development, as well as Ms. Ingrid Gabriela Hoven, member of the Board of Management of GIZ, the German Development Cooperation. We will watch the video messages in due time, but first, it's my pleasure again to welcome all the speakers, and um, I would like to start by addressing a question to His Excellency Ambassador Komanescu. Um, and the question is, you represent the Black Sea region, and what success stories, what best practices in terms of promoting trade and investment can you share with us from the Black Sea region? If you'd like to take the podium, please go ahead. If you prefer to be seated if also. You the of the case, <laughs> I will, uh, whatever, whatever you prefer. Okay. We make one bite. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Please. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Dear participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to congratulate the Union for the Mediterranean for their initiative to organize this very important event. Very important and timely regional event. And to thank them for their kind invitation extending to me to address this high level uh, audience. Before trying to react to the question uh, our distinguished moderator raised, allow me uh, to give you a hopefully very brief overview of the organization which I have the honor to represent today. The Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization was established in 92, 1992 and uh, transformed into a fully fledged international organization in 1999 with the entry into force of the Bishop Charter. 
basic economic cooperation organization. It's, it consists of uh, three countries, three, th 13 uh, member states, Albania, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Bulgaria, Georgia, Greece, Republic of Moldova, Republic of North Macedonia, Romania, the Russian Federation, Serbia, Turkey, and Ukraine. And uh, it's an organization related to what uh, are uh, quite frequently referring to as the wide, wider Black Sea area or Black Sea region, Bisek region. Next year, we will celebrate 30 years of uh, our existence. It may, it will be definitely uh, a, an opportunity for celebration, but I want to underline, it's my personal view, that while of course paying due attention to celebrating, I think that this is, would be, will be an excellent opportunity to look into our achievements so far, but equally to what type of hurdles we've been meeting over the time, and on this basis. And uh, now I'm speaking as Secretary General of the Permis, under the guidance of the chairmanships in office and of the other member states to come together and define and agree upon the guidelines and actions for the years to come so as to make of this organization an even more efficient one. Of course, in saying this, I need to mention that uh, we have to be realistic, even more so that uh, we are an organization uh, active, which is activating into a, uh, let's say euphemistically, a complex, a complex region of the world. So, uh, and mainly talking about the future, I think that we do, should do more and could do, we can do more so as to adapt to the challenges of today and as much as we can foresee to the challenges of tomorrow because uh, sometimes foreseeing, it's quite sometimes even difficult to foresee the past and not to speak about foreseeing the future. But let's be optimistic. Uh, I would add that uh, the BISEC organization uh, and the region, the wider Black Sea region, uh, I think that deserves to be look at it, considered with, uh, don't take me as lucky modesty, but should be considered as, uh, when looked at, is a genuine, genuinely, uh, very important, strategically speaking, region. Actually, the Black Sea area, Black Sea region, uh, is not a bridge, it's the bridge between East and West, between Europe and Asia. And why not a key crossroad for communication and transport North, South and East, West. And I'm, uh, I would like to congratulate the organizers for the way how they conceived the sequentiality of this uh, forum starting with the first panel dedicated to connectivity, mobility, transportation, and then to the, the, this panel where I'm supposed to say a little bit more. Uh, I want to say that, I want to underline this because no matter what we want to do in terms of the topic of, the, of this panel, growth, integration, 
You can do nothing without transportation, without connectivity, without mobility. So that's why I'm saying I very much congratulate the organizers for having this seg sequentiality. Uh, as I said, this organization is covering a region uh, which in itself is a microcosm. Why? Because, uh, as I said, it's a region which can't be qualified as very complex. It's a region where you have sensitivities, to say the least. It's a region uh, uh, consisting of uh, member states which are members of uh, the European Union, which are others members of the Eurasia Economic Union, uh, which you, you, are, you have uh, uh, So kind of, let's say, a, 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 a very mixed structure in terms of traditions, cultures. So in this, from this perspective, is also a region of crossroads. Not to speak about that many of the, uh, actually, the, the most important, uh, let's say, uh, cultural and uh, religious, why not? Uh, dimensions, you meet them all in the, in the Black Sea area. So in, from this perspective, BISEC is, and looking from this perspective, BISEC is the oldest, most representative, and institutionally mature digital economic organization here in the, uh, uh, I mean, in, in this part of, of, the, of the globe. And as far as the activity, is covering areas where are an organization of economic cooperation. So economic development, customs, business, SMEs, or other sector cooperation like transport, agriculture, energy, tourism, culture, education, science and technology, and yes, need of good governance, all these are areas of our activity. Energy, emergency, emergency assistance. We are in a region where thinking in terms of uh, natural events, not to say catastrophes, climate change and so on. It's a region where there are a lot of challenges to be dealt with. So now looking from the perspective of the topic of this panel, Allow me, allow me a few considerations. What BISEC does in concrete terms, and I hope, albeit probably only partially, uh, in, in, by so doing, to react to your questions, Mr. Moderator. For, first, BISEC is a forum for exchange of information on national developments sharing of best practices and know-how for networking and the development of contacts between national experts. It may seem unimpressive, I agree, but it, it is really essential, and I'll, I'm trying to tell you why. As I said, it's a region with sensitivities, a complex one, with sensitive bilateral relations among the, member, the countries there in the region, difficulties, sometimes perhaps competition. But the fact that in spite of all this, you know, it's an area where you have uh, the so-called uh, uh, frozen, sometimes uh, uh, qualified as protracted, uh, I would say persistent uh, areas even of conflict. And you may be surprised when I I'm telling you that in spite of all this complexity, the fact that even in this period of pandemic, uh, representatives of all these member states are getting together or, and around the table in, the, in this co co framework of the BISEC and talk about real things, even if they may look, as I mentioned, nitty-gritty. 
But they are coming there and talking and going back to their countries with proposals for their authorities to, to uh, uh, undertake action and follow. So uh, in this way, this organization is also contributing to a real confidence building atmosphere. Because it's important to talk about connectivity and mobility. It's extremely important if the, let's say, the simple citizens, individuals get together and exchange views and thus better understanding the situations in their respective countries rather than just only taking it over from what authorities may, may tell them. Second, uh, the BISIC provides an effective decision-making mechanism through the adoption of political declarations which set up general objectives for the enhancement of regional sectoral cooperation. Coming, resulting in memorandum, memoranda of understandings on various uh, topics. And, uh, you know, we, all this is carried out within the framework offered by the BISEC economic agenda endorsed in 2012 by the heads of state and government of the member states. Third, and straight to the question, Mr. Moderator, about lessons learned and success stories from the Black Sea economic area in terms of trade facilitation and investment promotion. I will start with transport sector. Not by mere chance, I try to explain myself why. Because, as I said, I repeat myself, and sorry to, uh, to repeat it, but really, it's not serious to talk about the moving forward or developing the economy without having appropriate infrastructure, which is, in, means transport, which means digitalization, by the way. And so, um, in, in, uh, in, in uh, addition to the development of the transport infrastructure in the region, our organizations in uh, constant efforts are aimed at harmonizing and simplifying procedure. Because sometimes, even if you have good roads, given the various obstacles and barriers, crossing, crossing borders, uh, uh, annoying uh, bureaucracy for the poor drivers, this is something which, if eased, appeased, if alleviated, helps a lot in, in, in movement, in the movement of goods and uh, values. And we've been trying to do something concrete in this respect. You may know that uh, in 2010, exactly aimed at this objective, uh, so what we call the BISEC permit system has been uh, developed as a concrete project where through the permanent secretariat in, in, in cooperation with the associations of the transport, road transport in the region and the International Road Transport Union, we are, we've been able to determine the authorities of the member states, nine of them, to get into this system and so to uh, deliver at the beginning of, for, of each year uh, for, the success, well, uh, for the successive years, number of permits what we consider appropriate for uh, allowing the drivers, the trucks of, uh, with goods, transport of goods, to move uh, much easier than, uh, than so far was the case. And uh, there are already some pilot projects within this uh, general system, like what has been developed between Turkey and Greece, or Turkey in, and Bulgaria. And you see, because if you look into, and especially in this period of, which was uh, with the difficulties generated by the pandemic, so you've been witnessing, looking at the TVs, long line and queues of trucks and so on, and poor drivers staying there in the free air, sometimes uh, with some personal security threats. And so if you allow, if you help them crossing much faster in an unorganized, uh, uh, it's a kind of, let's say, all-inclusive in terms of procedure, he arrives at the border, he gives you, you, he's give, you the documents 
Every, I mean, the, the authorities, uh, customs authorities, uh, and border and so on, they get through and allow him to move faster and, instead of staying there days and nights, sometimes in, during the winter. Yeah, and uh, much attention has been given to the trade facilitation promotion of single window and joint. There is a project in this respect. And uh, so uh, this is yet another example, concrete example which we have been trying to do. That, uh, also, we have, uh, in, uh, on the 30th of June this year, our decision-making bodies, I mean the Council of Foreign Ministers, adopted the framework for the BISEC e-commerce cooperation. And finally, as I said, trade facilitation strategy of the BISEC region and the framework for the BISEC single window opportunities. It's about facilitation of this. Last but not least, BISEC is engaged in project management. Since 2003, the BISEC Project Development Fund has helped tens of projects at their initial stage of development. The intensive cooperation with the European Union during the, the last couple of years has resulted in project-oriented approach, which brought many projects for the benefit of the member states. And I say, I will conclude with this, and once again saying that, uh, and express my personal satisfaction as far as the, how the cooperation between BISEC and the European Union has evolved, BISEC and the Union for the Mediterranean, and I think that the, the ground is there for doing even more in the, in the future for the benefit of our two regions which are actually part of the same, because I personally see the Black Sea as part of the Mediterranean. Thank you very much. Structure and digital connectivity as well. And uh, without further ado, I invite you all to watch the first video message by Isabelle Durand, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. I think it will be in French. I would like to invite the colleagues to kindly play the video. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I will do my statement in French, so I give you the time to uh, take the channel French. Mesdames et Messieurs, l'intégration économique stimule la croissance. Je crois que nous sommes tous d'accord sur ce point. Et de ce point de vue, l'Union européenne est un excellent exemple de la manière dont l'intégration économique a conduit à des liens beaucoup plus étroits et de la coopération entre ces différentes composantes. Aujourd'hui, environ deux tiers du commerce international de l'Europe se fait entre pays européens. Il s'agit d'ailleurs de la part la plus élevée du commerce intra-régional dans le monde, qui a ouvert de nombreuses opportunités et qui est porteuse globalement d'une grande prospérité. À l'extrémité sud de la Méditerranée, la zone de libre-échange continentale africaine est entrée en vigueur le 1er janvier 2021. Il s'agit d'un accord historique qui réunit 1,2 milliard de personnes avec un produit intérieur brut combiné de 2 à 3 000 milliards de dollars. Il s'agit de la plus grande zone de libre-échange au monde en termes de pays participants. L'intégration est évidemment motivée par l'espoir d'intensifier les relations économiques, d'accroître le commerce intra-africain et les investissements dans la région et bien sûr de créer des emplois. Mais si l'on considère la région méditerranéenne, là juste entre les deux, dans son ensemble, on constate que le commerce est fortement lié aux plaques tournantes d'Europe occidentale. Et il y a incontestablement une marge de progrès pour intensifier le commerce dans cette région et saisir l'opportunité que cela peut représenter. Stimuler le commerce régional implique au minimum la prise en compte de trois éléments. Le premier et le deuxième d'ailleurs sont liés au transport. Le transport maritime est évidemment essentiel, y compris pour le commerce en Méditerranée. Nous savons que plus de 80% du commerce mondial de marchandises passe par nos océans. La pandémie a d'ailleurs accéléré les méga-tendances du transport maritime 
qui pourrait transformer le secteur à plus long terme. Entre autres, la numérisation et l'automatisation qui ont gagné en puissance et qui devraient permettre de diminuer les coûts, mais aussi de gagner en efficacité. Cependant, l'industrie du transport maritime est également confrontée à l'adaptation et à la résilience climatique. Et la décarbonisation et des carburants alternatifs pour réduire les émissions constitue une nécessité urgente dont le secteur est d'ailleurs bien conscient. Mais cela aura évidemment un coût. La perturbation due au Covid-19 a aussi mis en évidence les vulnérabilités des chaînes d'approvisionnement existantes et la nécessité de les renforcer, ce qui a relancé le débat sur la mondialisation et les chaînes d'approvisionnement du futur. Deuxième élément, les pays doivent mettre en œuvre des mesures de facilitation des échanges pour améliorer leur compétitivité commerciale et l'efficacité de leurs agences frontalières. Et c'est particulièrement vrai pour la participation des pays en développement aux chaînes de valeur mondiale et au commerce des produits manufacturés. Les petites et moyennes entreprises en particulier bénéficient de la réduction des coûts et des délais de transaction. Faciliter les échanges doit donc se penser et se mettre en place au niveau régional. Et à cet égard, c'est le niveau le plus adéquat. Et c'est pourquoi la facilitation des échanges devrait être incluse dans les programmes d'intégration régionale. Bien entendu, un aspect essentiel de l'intégration est l'accès préférentiel au marché. Pour que cela se produise, un produit doit être originaire de la région préférentielle. C'est ce qu'on appelle les règles d'origine qui déterminent la provenance d'un produit. Pour aider un pays à tirer avantage de bénéfices des accords, davantage, davantage de bénéfices des accords commerciaux préférentiels, les règles d'origine devraient être simples, transparentes et favorables aux entreprises pour leur permettre, entre autres les Africaines, de tirer profit de l'intégration régionale. Enfin, nous observons que les organisations économiques régionales du monde entier adoptent de plus en plus un droit et une politique de la concurrence au niveau régional, ou s'engagent à coopérer pour veiller à ce que les avantages de la libéralisation du commerce ne soient pas compromis par des pratiques anticoncurrentielles. Pour soutenir ce développement, la CNUSET a aidé les organisations économiques régionales, y compris en Méditerranée, à mettre en place des organes régionaux et à renforcer les capacités des fonctionnaires chargés de l'application de ces règles et de la protection des consommateurs. Mesdames et messieurs, le Covid-19 a encore accru nous le savons tous, l'importance de la coopération régionale et internationale. La pandémie a montré à quel point nous sommes vulnérables si le virus continue à se propager en raison du manque d'accès au vaccin ou d'une action coordonnée pour garder le virus sous contrôle. Cela demande donc aussi de la solidarité. Et enfin, nous savons que le changement climatique est et sera de plus en plus déterminant dans l'avenir. La Méditerranée est un espace particulièrement affecté par le changement climatique et ce n'est pas votre secrétaire général qui me contredira. Il devient donc de plus en plus prioritaire d'y développer des politiques ambitieuses en matière d'énergie renouvelable, d'eau, d'environnement, d'économie bleue et de tourisme durable pour n'en citer que quelques-unes. En outre, et c'est un facteur positif, le changement climatique devrait favoriser des marchés régionaux en raison de leur plus faible empreinte carbone. C'est donc aussi une opportunité pour les échanges et l'intégration au sein de votre région. Voilà les éléments que je voulais partager avec vous. Je vous souhaite une réunion fructueuse, fructueuse pardon, et je tiens mon organisation à votre disposition pour aller plus loin sur ces différentes questions et je me réjouis, je l'espère, d'un prochain échange en personne dans un prochain avenir. Thank you very much. And uh, without further ado, I move directly to the next speaker. And uh, he will be delivering his intervention in reply to my question in French, but uh, he allowed me to pose the question in English. And uh, my question, Excellency, is the following. One of the, of the key recommendations emanating from the UFM Progress Report on Regional Integration has to do with trade facilitation and investment promotion. Algeria has already taken some very remarkable steps towards attracting investments into some strategic economic sectors. And my question, actually my petition for you, is to maybe elaborate a little bit on the Algerian experience in this regard. Thank you, may I? Of course, please. Thank you, Excellency. I, I remind your good 
yourself and myself. Do you have eight minutes? We, we will try to be more German than Mr. Schall in this uh, panel. <laughs> I'll try. But coming from the south. <laughs> Merci. Uh, first of all, Salam Alaikum, Azul Fulawan. Hello, everybody. I will try to answer in French, as Mohamed told you. Quelques commentaires. Uh, J'aimerais tout d'abord uh, vous remercier pour uh, cette invitation et remercier les autorités espagnoles pour l'accueil uh, qui nous a été uh, accordé ici dans cette uh, belle ville de Barcelone, une des villes symboles de la Méditerranée. Et comme nous l'avons vu lors du précédent panel, les échanges que nous avons entendus, euh, dès qu'on parle de Méditerranée, il y a de la passion. J'ai en tête les, les interventions des deux jeunes personnes qui se sont exprimées venant de la bordure sud. Euh, J'ai également à, en tête la passion du représentant hellénique euh, et du secteur privé qui a parlé avec beaucoup de passion. Et il y a l'aspect humain. On aura beau parler de digital, de technologie, mais tout tourne autour de l'aspect humain et la Méditerranée, berceau des trois religions abrahamiques, euh, s'est bâtie avec l'homme et se fera toujours à travers l'homme. Je reviens à la, à, la, à la question et quelque part en vous répondant, c'est vous faire part de la perception de l'Algérie par rapport à ce processus euro-méditerranéen, par rapport à l'Union pour la Méditerranée. Après 26 ans, euh, qu'en est-il aujourd'hui On a parlé de verre à demi-plein et de verre euh, transparent. Ben, L'état des lieux n'est pas très réjouissant. Euh, en tous les cas, c'est le constat que, que nous faisons. Juste pour revenir au départ, l'Algérie, comme l'ensemble des pays méditerranéens, s'est toujours inscrite dans l'histoire de ce bassin, depuis la plus haute antiquité, voire même avant. Dès notre indépendance, tous nos projets se sont inscrits à travers notre vision stratégique avec notre partenaire européen. Avec le processus de Barcelone que, auquel nous avons adhéré, rappelez-vous combien beaucoup d'entre nous étions très optimistes au début des années 90 quant à l'avenir de la Méditerranée. Cela a permis de signer l'accord de Barcelone et d'entamer ensuite des négociations pour arriver à des accords d'association. Mon pays a signé cet accord en avril 2002 je dois vous le dire, dans la précipitation. Nous n'étions pas prêts. Malheureusement, et c'est un constat que beaucoup de partenaires euro-méditerranéens et un fond, que ce soit au nord ou au sud, le fait d'avoir négocié chacun de son côté, peut-être que ça n'a pas été très utile sur, pour le moyen et le long terme. Et aujourd'hui, euh, nous le voyons davantage. L'Algérie, depuis quelque temps maintenant, a fait un constat. Cet accord n'a pas été bon pour nous, vu les modalités, et nous nous apprêtons, avec le consentement de, des partenaires européens, de revoir un petit peu tout ça, afin d'aller vers quelque chose qui soit profitable aux deux, et voir à l'ensemble des partenaires que nous sommes, que nous sommes. Comme vous le savez, L'Algérie, depuis 2019, est rentrée dans une nouvelle ère. Après le mouvement populaire du Hirak, El Mubarak, El Asil, nous avons eu une élection présidentielle en décembre 2019. <coughs> Vous m'excuserez, je viens d'arriver en Espagne et j'ai attrapé froid. Si je perds la voix, je <coughs> ne m'en voulais pas. Euh, et depuis l'élection du président Tebboune, l'Algérie est en train de...
mes excuses. L'Algérie a entamé un, un train de réforme qui a été retardé par la pandémie du Covid-19 qui nous a tous touchés. Cela nous a permis de, également de prendre la température de l'état de notre économie, qui n'était pas très bonne, mais l'Algérie a fait preuve de résilience pendant cette pandémie. Je ne vais pas revenir, il y a beaucoup de données statistiques qui ont été données euh, précédemment. Elles sont plutôt bonnes, mais le plus important, c'est sur le plan des réformes structurelles que mon pays a entamé et qui, et qui sont d'une importance capitale pour notre développement, notre croissance et en même temps pour notre inscription dans la logique euh, régionale. régionale. Très rapidement, s'agissant du climat des affaires, il y a une décision des plus importantes que tout le monde attendait et qui a été critiqué pendant des années par nombre de nos partenaires, la règle du 51-49 pour les investisseurs a été levée. Dieu merci, nous revenons à plus de cohérence économique. C'est-à-dire que le changement de logiciel qui est lancé depuis des mois maintenant et qui va s'affirmer davantage dans les semaines et les mois à venir va dans le sens de la mise en place d'une véritable économie pour rappel L'Algérie a pendant longtemps été une économie à caractère administré et la transition a été difficile. Les 20 dernières années ont été quelque peu compliquées en dépit euh, de certains signaux économiques qui avaient l'air euh, positifs. L'amélioration du climat des affaires que nos partenaires et surtout les opérateurs, qu'ils soient publics ou privés tout d'abord au niveau national, il y a un ressentiment, et à l'étranger également. Et il y a de nouvelles dynamiques, de nouvelles synergies qui nous laissent présager euh, d'excellentes opportunités avec les différents partenaires. Pour, ayant en tête les cinq priorités du, du, du rapport, Différentes mesures ont été prises sur le plan financier, euh, notamment, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, et euh, je ne vais pas rentrer dans le détail, mais ce sont des décisions rationnelles qui touchent à la fiscalité. Et pour le secteur privé, j'aurais aimé que notre ami grec soit, soit là. Il aurait pu corroborer et nous aurions pu échanger à ce niveau-là. Maintenant, par rapport à l'intégration, de manière plus générale, et en termes de connectivité, c'est le terme qui revient de manière... Uh, I was told two more minutes, no more. OK, I take it. Um, depuis son indépendance, l'Algérie a inscrit sa politique de développement dans le cadre régional, continental et transméditerranéen. Tous nos grands projets d'infrastructure s'inscrivent dans ce sens-là. À titre d'exemple, pour rappel, nous avons une autoroute Est-Ouest qui est longue de près de 1200 km. Il y a également la route transsaharienne, près de 5000 km, qui va d'Alger jusqu'à Lagos également. Et actuellement, depuis quelque temps, il y a un très grand projet de port commercial de l'Hamdania. Qui, est en, qui, a, qui vient d'être lancé. Tout ça, là, pour vous dire, nous nous inscrivons pleinement dans le cadre de l'interconnectivité avec nos différents partenaires, qu'ils soient africains. Et dans la, présente, la précédente euh, intervention, il a été rappelé euh, l'entrée en vigueur de, du ZLECAF, donc euh, de la zone de libre-échange africaine, pour laquelle l'Algérie adhère complètement et s'inscrit totalement. Nous l'avons vu au cours des derniers mois par différents projets au niveau de nos différents voisins transfrontaliers, et cela en dépit de la situation sécuritaire qui prévaut malheureusement au niveau du, du Sahel. Euh, Son Excellence l'Ambassadeur l'a rappelé pour 
en évoquant la mer Noire, euh, porte vers l'Asie. On nous a toujours dit que l'Algérie est la porte pour le continent, l'ensemble du continent, comme l'ensemble de l'Afrique du Nord. Il y a de belles perspectives. Je ne vais pas rentrer dans, dans, dans davantage de détails, mais ce qu'il faudrait euh, avoir à l'esprit, et je reviens au, à ce qui avait été dit par nos jeunes intervenants tout à l'heure, un dialogue franc, sincère. Notre vision à tous, au départ, c'est d'avoir un bassin méditerranéen en paix, ce qui est loin d'être le cas au jour d'aujourd'hui. Et nous espérons tous y arriver, parce qu'on aura beau parler de technicité, de réglementation, etc., mais s'il n'y a pas de bonne foi de part et d'autre, on n'y arrivera pas. On n'y arrivera pas. Ceci étant, on n'a pas le choix. Nous, nous devons d'être optimistes. Vous savez que l'un des plus beaux symboles que nous portons tous, c'est la feuille d'olivier. Nos ancêtres l'ont toujours porté avec cette idée de, de paix. Et euh, il faut aller dans ce sens-là. Maintenant, quand on parle de gouvernance, il serait très facile de reprocher aux uns et aux autres... Il y a beaucoup de reproches à faire, c'est-à-dire que certaines directives viennent souvent du Nord, mais le Sud aussi a, a fauté. Il y a des dynamiques que nous observons, mais s'il n'y a pas de financement, s'il n'y a pas d'investissement, nous voyons certains pays, notamment au Moyen-Orient et plus proches, qui étaient bien partis, qui avaient de bonnes conditions, qui se retrouvent aujourd'hui dans des situations de banqueroute, s'il n'y a pas une aide sincère, je ne vais même pas parler de sincérité, il ne faut pas être naïf. Mais quand on parle d'intérêt stratégique pour la rive nord, nous sommes liés. Ce qui nous touche, je prends l'exemple de mon pays dans les années 90 et je terminerai là-dessus. Nous avons été les premiers à, toucher, à, été, à être touchés par le terrorisme et nous disions à tout le monde, faites attention. Ils ont commencé par nous, tôt ou tard, ils viendront chez vous. Personne ne nous prenait au sérieux. Regardez ce que nous vivons aujourd'hui. Et jouer avec le feu, ça peut se retourner contre soi. D'où sincérité et intérêt stratégique devraient nous mener à la sagesse et aller de l'avant. Et je vous souhaite à tous une excellente continuation dans les discussions que nous aurons. Et je vous remercie. J'aurais pu continuer également. <rire> Thank you very much, Excellency, for this uh, heartfelt uh, message as well. And uh, I now proceed to uh, Ms. Anna Terron. And my question has to do with the, the instruments that we have available to promote regional economic integration through public policies and public cooperation. So the floor is yours, and I remind everyone that we're short on time. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's my also personal and professional pleasure to be here and I would like to thank you very much Mohammed for your kind words and Secretary and the new and, 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 and very active Secretariat of the Union for the Mediterranean to invite me here. I will try to be as short as possible. I, I, I very much like to start where you have left this uh, uh, in, in, in the idea of how can we build stability and, and uh, peace in the region and uh, how can we better do what is the, the, the purpose of this seminar analyze, how can we create jobs through investment and, and, and trade and, and what instruments can we use for that? Well, first of all, I, I, I would like to say that the two are very much linked. I mean, there is a hard security agenda which are not going to be which we are not going to address here today, but there is a link between this peace and stability in it and the whole idea of how we can uh, better build a region which, or to build a region able to not leave anyone behind. Not leave anyone behind is key. Uh, and what we are witnessing increasingly in both shares, in, the, in both shares, is a coexistence of very dynamic and 
21st, let's say, 22nd century oriented centers surrounded sometimes by a sort of medieval chaos in which we scarcely can speak about social cohesion, even of uh, a real society. How to link these two areas? It's absolutely key. Uh, let me say that, first of all, uh, I, I would like to point out how important is governance and how important is to build up a good institutional um, framework to work on legislation, to work on public policies, to create the trust we need in order to foster trade and investment. Uh, we need to ensure reforms in both sides in order to create this, this trust that can allow us to work together in, in two shares. Mohamed, I'm going to jump from one point to another just to mention them. We can retake them in the, in the, in the question time if we are allowed to have that. Um, <clears throat> second point, in order to ensure this better environment for trade and investment, second point is that we really, I, I, I have experience to work with very interesting instruments in the area of the EU and the Mediterranean cooperation. I, I, I very much regret that the, our colleague from GIZ is not here because we would probably share that uh, with her. But we have the, the, the experience on working together bilaterally with instruments like training. We are very much working administration to administration in peer to peer um, project through this very old and uh, very well used uh, instrument uh, financed by the European Union but owned really by all of us neighbors and uh, EU member states. Second instrument we, we have in, in, in this EU um, toolbox, um, I would like to, to, to bring here, belongs to an other intra-regional uh, cooperation, but I think that they're very, very interesting. And I would like to mention here some EU, Latin America, regional building instruments we are using, because I think that we can very much learn from them. I would like to talk on Euroclima, Eurosocial, and Pacto, which are respectively uh, climate change and environment, social cohesion, and security programs, or focused programs, uh, which can work in a complementarity way, and which have the idea and of working both to both intra-regionally and through a very strong methodology of something we call uh, Mesa Pais, which can be translated into, into um, bilateral, inserted into this regional uh, platform dialogue, uh, which have been very, very useful to assure this transformation we need in, in the region. And I would very much like to, to propose to analyze this methodology in order to work together for this uh, transformative process to create the conditions for a better dialogue among us and between our societies. Uh, I think that the, the Timi Europe initiative launched uh, by the Union for the Mediterranean can have inside this kind of um, instruments and, and can work better by looking at this very still and again transformative methodologies. Uh, I do think, and I'm going to end with that, that decent jobs is the key word in both sides of the Mediterranean to build a secure, sustainable future. We have to learn together on how can we look forward to having these decent jobs, jobs, sorry, and this 
more cohesion social oriented programs. I stop here, happy to retake any kind of uh, issue uh, we, 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 can, we can tackle from all those points and sorry because I jumped from one <laughs> into another just to limit myself to this eight minutes. I hope I've been capable to put on the table those points for further discussion. It, Thank you very much. It's very much appreciated. Thank you for this uh, sprint, if I may call it so. <laughs> and. Uh, Yes, thank you for ending on this note of learning together and the need for co-creation of value. I now ask the colleagues to play the second video message and the last one uh, by Ms. Ingrid Gabriela Hoven, member of the Board of Management of GIZ, the German Development Cooperation. Dear Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be part of this UFM event on regional integration, which carries the title from policy recommendation to implementation. Since the beginning of the Barcelona process in 1995, it has become clear that regional integration in the Mediterranean is a necessity, but at the same time also remains a huge challenge. Today, more than 25 years later, we can see that overall integration has progressed in the region but far below its potential compared to the region's capacities and resources. This has been clearly underlined by the first UFM progress report on regional integration, which was published in May this year. We as GIZ were glad to be able to support. The report is a novelty because it investigates and quantifies for the first time the level of integration in the region in the most important policy areas. It also shows how integration has progressed unevenly across the UFMU region and its subregions, especially in the South-South economic integration. In fact, it has one of the lowest levels of trade integration worldwide. Of all trade flows in the Mediterranean, 94% of exports come from the European Union and only very little trade takes place amongst the southern and eastern Mediterranean neighbors themselves. For instance, according to the UFM progress report, 70% of cargo trade occurs in EU ports, 15% between the EU and the southern Mediterranean countries, and only 5% between the countries in the MENA region. Some reasons for the lack of integration are the difficult political environment, very similar export products and a frequently used narrative of competition instead of cooperation. Also, most FDI and experts for the region still focus on extractive industries and goods with low and medium technology levels. Such experts offer only few possibilities for an integration in regional or global value chains. In addition, a lack of industrial diversification and quality infrastructure, very high trade costs, many non-tariff barriers and regulatory barriers to trade and services impede the economic development for the countries. Increased trade and investment have not always had the impact we were hoping for, especially when it comes to employment effects. This is problematic because the challenge for labor markets in the region is enormous. The Southern Mediterranean has one of the highest informality rates in the world, representing an average of 68% of employment in the region. Youth unemployment in the MENA region between 2014 and 2019 was consistently above 25%. And because of the COVID-19 pandemic, it has gone up to almost 50% in some Southern Mediterranean countries. At the same time, by 2030, we expect 39 million additional young people to arrive on the labor market in the southern Mediterranean, while in Europe, the number of retirees will be outpacing new workers. This shows how important it is to mainstream employment into all our activities in the region. We need to make sure that regional economic integration is not an end in itself, but rather a promoter for job creation, decent employment and sustainable development. 
we need to use the potential that is available in the region. For instance, we are dealing with the most educated young generation ever in the region, a motivated generation with a great entrepreneurial spirit and eager to make a difference. To take advantage of the region's potential and to tackle the remaining barriers to economic integration, we need regional institutions such as the UFM, which constantly remind us of our region-wide challenges and help us to identify our common interests. At the same time, we need to do a lot of work on the ground by tackling country-specific challenges in a joint effort of many actors and stakeholders. Our work under the German Development Corporation is defined by this collaborative spirit and by an integrated approach through which we address the different sides of economic development and employment. We intend to strengthen the private sector, especially SMEs, in order to increase the demand for jobs. We intend to increase the employability of job seekers. And we support public policies and public employment services. To this end, we work with many partners in the region, for instance, in order to strengthen financial systems and to promote the financial inclusion of individuals and SMEs. We support crucial value chains with the goal to not only increase the quantity of exports, but to increase the value addition that is generated in our partner countries. And as another example, we support the design of economic policies in our partner countries and promote opportunities for vocational training and education. All of this demands a close cooperation with national governments, regional and international organizations, the private sector, civil society and academia. But it is worth the effort, because any lack of integration will come at high costs and the potential of the region is enormous. This is why we, as GIZ, we are very happy to be supporting the UFM and to continue our engagement in the region together with the countries of the Southern and Eastern Mediterranean. Thank you very much. And we are also very happy to work closely with the team of GIZ. Um, I know you might have some questions or comments for the speakers here. This is why we have a networking lunch. It's the opportunity to approach them directly over lunch. So please join me to give a round of applause to all our panelists here. Thank you very much for joining us. And it is now uh, my pleasure to give the floor to His Excellency Nasser Kamel, the Secretary General of the Union for the Mediterranean, who will be delivering the closing remarks. Excellency, please join us. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you very much. Uh, I must confess that I missed most of the very enriching discussion you had this morning because we have, in parallel, of course, our foreign ministers meeting. And before I, I give you my pre-prepared uh, remarks, uh, out of 23 intervention by the foreign minister, at least 18 or 17 of them have mentioned the issue of regional integration. Not in a positive light, I must say. But by mentioning our report, the one we've been discussing all day, as evidence of how fragmented, economically speaking, the region is, and how we are punching really below our weight when it comes to regional integration in the region. Should I go with my written speech? Huh? Huh? Well, I will. Huh? because it will stay in the record, so we have to. So, dear friends, excellency, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of this extraordinary event that pre perfectly captures the essence of our overarching goal as an organization, I'm talking, of course, about the UFM, namely the promotion of integration and cooperation in our region. 
Allow me to thank you for joining us and sharing your valuable insight on economic regional integration in different domains, especially at this very difficult time where, when we are all witnessing the new development happening all over the world concerning the pandemic. Much has been said about the economic repercussions of the current pandemic and how it has further aggravated the already existing socioeconomic disparities between and within both shores of the Mediterranean. We keep saying building back better, but to build back better, time is not the only factor that matters because size also matters when it comes to recovering and building resilience. Historically, world markets always held that size matters because of the economic of scale and scope that could be realized through higher levels of production and consumption. Recently, however, the notion of size has become even more relevant and become associated with the need for bigger and more integrated economies. Like the EU, and the EU and its neighbor can definitely, if they integrate economically speaking, better can counterbalance the gravity of the new giants, India, China, and I dare say NAFTA also. One lesson learned from the crisis also is that the UFM, meaning the Euro-Mediterranean region, could have fared much better if a deeper integration was in place. But there is always an opportunity in the aftermath of each crisis. And the already undergoing reconfiguration of regional and global supply chain or chains could unlock a huge win-win potential for both shores of the Mediterranean in terms of FDI flows, industrial diversification, job creation, and sustainable growth. Today, you discuss some of the policy recommendations emanating from, of course, the report we did with OECD on regional integration in domains of paramount importance for the region and its future. You have tackled the issue of infrastructure, digital connectivity. I think the Secretary of State of Spain has, yes. has spoken because she told me she, she, she focused a lot on this and she, and she saw the interest of the audience and the participant in terms of the digital and the digital gap between the north and the south is quite shocking. I mean, I don't know if she gave you some figures, but uh, only 8% of uh, SMEs in the South have access. Have access. Only 2% of retail have a digital footprint. This is not sustainable. Education and skills, trade facilitation, investment promotion, all of that. And I would like to thank you all for having tackled all those issues and to tell you that you will take good note of the outcome of this amendment. They will guide our strategic compass for a series of event, action, programs dedicated to economic integration over the coming years. We are building with GIZ and BMZ, the German International Cooperation Ministry, a UFM, UFM hub for trade, investment, Job. and employment. Job or employment? Employment. And just today, Spain has announced a very sizable contribution to that German initiative, a new FM initiative. So we will be a platform for employment creation in the region with the help of our German and Spanish colleagues. And that is a very welcome news. Personally, I would like to stress our belief in the fact that any talk about a progress and recovery in our region without due emphasis on integration, and by integration, mainly economic integration, is a counterfeit currency. And this is why we remain always committed to accompanying all the efforts aiming at promoting regional integration as a prerequisite of inclusive and resilient growth. Once more, thank you very much, and I look forward to welcoming you all in future events. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Excellency. And now I invite you all to a networking lunch, which will be at Studio 8, which is walking out and to the right. Thank you, and see you there. During, during the lunch, perhaps.